Welcome allemaal bij het Brainwash Festival. Welcome everyone to the Brainwash Festival here in the audience and also the people watching online. My name is Mirte Vreet and I'll have the incredible honor to in the next 45 minutes talk to Olivia Ling. Um, they are the author of many acclaimed non-fiction books like uh, The Trip to Eco Spring and Lonely Cities which was translated in I think more than 17 languages and sold 100,000 copies. But this afternoon, we will focus on their latest book. It's called uh, Everybody, a book about freedom. Um, welcome, Olivia, I think. Yeah, hi. <laughs> um, Olivia Ling, I have, I've read your book with so much uh, joy and eagerness. And <laughs> my kids were saying, what are you doing? Because I was literally scribbling every sentence in the book with their color pencils and, and uh, because the thing that you do is that uh, you link so many interesting thinkers from Susan Sontag to Marquise de Sade to Malcolm X to concepts like uh, sickness, uh, sexual uh, freedom, but also sexual violence, revolution, incarceration. And you do this in a kind of, you make it look easy, but it must have been a real tour de force to bring all these thinkers and concepts together. And well, we have 45 minutes, so of course we cannot um, discuss all these interesting people, but we will touch upon some of them. And I really hope that, well, if you, that you will buy this book, and uh, maybe you already have. Um, but so let's start. And oh yeah, also for the audience, like in the end, there is a room for uh, one or two questions. Okay, so uh, Olivia. You introduce us to many interesting uh, thinkers, but there's one central person, and that is William Reich. Uh, Reich, we say, I don't know, Reich, do you say in English Reich? We say Reich, yeah, Reich, but I think yeah. it, it should be Reich. You're saying it correctly. Reich, no, Reich. But, um, <laughs> so could you please first um, tell a little bit about the context in which William Reich developed his ideas, and then especially, of course, his ideas about the body in relation to freedom? Yeah, absolutely. So Rank, Rank was Freud's most brilliant protégé. He was a young man who came out of the First World War as a penniless, starving soldier, really barely past a teenager in his early 20s. And he trained to be a doctor, but he felt all the time deeply frustrated that what he was being told about the body was somehow not enough. It felt very mechanical to him. It didn't really capture his feeling of what it means to be embodied. And during this time, he came across the ideas of Freud and began to work with Freud, became a psychoanalyst and began to see patients. And this is right at the beginning of psychoanalysis when it was nothing like as codified as it seems now. There weren't rules in the same way that there are now. And so Wright was free to be very experimental. And what he began to think was happening is that he would see patients and they would speak or not speak. Often they'd be silent and he would feel increasingly that what was happening is that their bodies were speaking to him his their bodies were speaking very purely and with absolute truth about what their emotional experience was and had been he began to develop a theory that traumatic experience lodges in people's bodies that they become repositories for the experiences of the past for trauma for frightening experiences but also for experiences that are forbidden so perhaps shaming experiences, perhaps girls weren't allowed to be angry or perhaps boys weren't allowed to cry. And these clamping down on emotion causes a sort of armoring effect. The muscles hold all of this emotion in and Wright wanted to work directly on that level. So this is Wright's first revelation. And then he is working in a clinic, mostly with working class people. And he begins to realize for the second time what is happening to his patients isn't just about the family, it isn't just about personal trauma, it's political. What happens to them, what lodges in their bodies, is also a political experience. It's about housing, it's about sexual relations, it's about violence, it's about poverty. So he begins to see that the only way towards freedom for people is to make sense of and change the political world that they live inside. Yeah, you write that he is really interested also, or gets really interested into Marx. Um, is this also why you find him so important and maybe 
uh, that he really makes this step not only to the individual traumas you have and or inherited, but that it's also it's almost like a, a an institutionalized trauma people have. Absolutely. I mean, Wright was working a hundred years ago, and yet I think his ideas are so relevant to our moment now that by putting the focus on people's bodies, by also seeing that what happens to us and what feels so individually painful can often be a collective experience, can have collective causes, and very importantly, this is Reich's third revelation, can be collectively resisted, that our bodies on the streets can change the conditions that we're under and can create larger freedom for all of us. Yeah. He, does, you, he called this like a character armor, like... Character armor. Yeah, this is, could you, what would be the definition of character armor? I think the easiest way to understand it is to think about an actor. If an actor is playing a role, they embody it in some way. If they're playing somebody who's very tense, we see that in their body. If they're playing somebody who is very shut down, we see that in their body. So instinctively, we understand that people hold their character inside their bodies, that people are almost sort of trapped inside a rigid, habitual way of being. And what Reich felt is that you could break that down, that you could feel those lost feelings of the past, and then you could be freer to act in different ways, freer to respond more richly to the world that you live inside. Yeah, he also links this, this, this feelings of uh, frustrations that are locked in our body uh, to fascism, eh? because he lives right before the Second World War starts. He sees, Nazi, uh, he sees um, the Nazis coming, or the uprising of the Nazis. And then later, much more later in the book, uh, you go to James Baldwin, who, who also read uh, Reich, and who also believed that I think, let's see what he calls like this the emotional repression that he thinks a lot of American s experience is also uh, one of the causes of the racism in the country. Um, yeah, could you explain a little bit more about the way those, those two people like Baldwin and Reich saw this, but also the different ideas they had when it comes to the solution? Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the things, one of the reasons I chose Rank as a character is because his ideas have been picked up by so many people involved in freedom struggles all across the world, right through the 20th century. So mm. Sontag is interested in Baldwin is interested in him. And I think what Baldwin saw in him and what makes Baldwin such an interesting figure within the civil rights movement is that he was so interested in emotional repression. He was so interested in the way in which people's sense of woundedness causes them to be violent, cruel, hostile, to, to enter into fascistic activity, to enter into white supremacist activity. And again, this is so relevant for our own times. Reich's, Reich's understanding of that was really that the system that caused people to shut down in the way that he saw they did is patriarchal capitalism. And Baldwin adds to that that it's white supremacist patriarchal capitalism. But the, these systems are designed to make people obedient, hyper-disciplined, completely in service to a sort of violent ideology. And I think, you know, over the last 10 years or so in Europe, we have all in our own countries witnessed that kind of uprising again. We're all seeing the rise of the far right. We're all seeing the terrible effects of that. And in America too, with the Trump movement. So these people's ideas feel very urgently relevant. And what really matters to me is that they're talking about two different ways of creating change simultaneously, that it's about political activism, but it's also about internal work. It's not one or the other, it has to be both. Yeah, and I think that Reich believed that you really um, could release those feelings, yeah? also by all the therapies he developed. Um, Baldwin had other ideas about this. Or yeah, I think um, one of the... So Reich is a complicated character. He's a character who sometimes has wonderful illuminating ideas and sometimes has ideas that are really out there. They're really mm, pseudoscientific and not helpful. So increasingly through his life, he began to think more about sort of almost pseudoscientific solutions, whereas Baldwin is clearly, he's part of the civil rights movement and he believes in activism. So mm. what I wanted to do was really lean back in time to the young Reich, the Reich of the 1920s and 1930s, who is equally involved in anti-fascist activism. That was the sort of period of his ideas that I found personally most useful and most relevant for our times, which is you can't change the world without changing the vast systems, vast toxic 
poisonous systems that we operate inside. Yeah. Let's go to um, the, another concept related to this, not uh, freedom. And you write a lot about uh, Marquis de Sade and uh, his ideas about freedom. Um, what do you find so fascinating about what it is that uh, Marquis de Sade points out about, I think he calls it liberty, but free, yeah, yeah. we can also call yeah. it freedom. What I think about de Sade and what I found so interesting about de Sade is that those books, they're horrifying, they're really hard to read, but I think that my reading of de Sade is that he is creating a very sceptical vision of what absolute freedom looks like. Absolute freedom is not the same as the freedom that the civil rights movement are demanding. It's a freedom to do what you want, regardless of the humanity of the person that you're doing it to. So it's the freedom of the rape camp. It's the freedom of the genocide. It's the freedom of the Holocaust. It's a freedom that involves one person having absolute liberty over another person. And that kind of vision, you know, again, it's, it's very implicated in patriarchal we see and in white supremacy we see it all the time and I think having that kind of skeptical figure inside a book that's about freedom allows us to be much more nuanced about thinking about what freedom is and what kind of freedom we want I think another way of thinking about this that's a sort of smaller example is the issue of mask wearing so of mask, of mask, issue, wearing. Yeah. mask wearing yeah, yeah. within the covid crisis there's been yeah. so much sort of resistance to people wearing masks I don't want to do this. I demand the right not to. And actually, what mask wearing is, is a different kind of vision of freedom. It's a vision of collective freedom. It means that we are all taking care of each other. So one person's slight limiting of liberty allows an enlargement of a group of people's liberties. And that's the kind of freedom that I'm much more interested in. Yeah. It's how to enlarge the freedoms of all of us, not how to enlarge the freedom of one person over another. Yeah. And because it's also about the, the whether the sad was interpreted right or misinterpreted, you know? Yeah. Um, because do you think people took him too literally? <laughs> well, I think his, I mean, I read it as skeptical, but I think a lot of people read it as sort of, yay, this is gratifying. This is a vision of um, sexual liberty and sexual cruelty that I wish to subscribe to. So I think an awful lot of misogynist writers have... Mm -hmm read Saad over the years and thought, this is a thing that I, I think is good. This is a kind of freedom that I want to perpetuate. And I think maybe miss that tone of skepticism and cynicism that I hear quite clearly. But, you know, this is, this is my view of it. If we put another famous feminist figure, Andrea Dworkin, her reading of De Saad is very different. She sees him as almost the um, poster boy of patriarchy, of patriarchal cruelties, of sexual violence to women. And I think it's more nuanced than that. Yeah, but I really want to go to uh, Dworkin, but uh, yeah, yeah. just, uh, I was wondering, since you are also a writer, do you also write fiction, uh, right? Or all only nonfiction? Yeah. yeah, because there's this whole debate, of course, whether writers are completely free to write whatever they eh, like. And um, I was wondering how you look then to the work of the sad, like if you would picture it now, like if a man would write like this rape fantasy in a, in a novel, like do you think it still is part of, you know, the artistic freedom or does it almost legitimize a culture of rape? I think that is such an interesting and important question right now. And I think it's so much about intention as well. I think it's so much about what somebody's trying to explore. Like you could be writing a novel about rape that is trying to crack open and expose how those systems work. Or you could be just gratifying your own impulses and urges. And I feel like it's kind of there for the reader to figure out. And I'm very anti-censorship. I don't approve of censorship. I don't approve of cancelling the authors of the past. I think that that information is of interest and of use to us to understand how people think, even if we don't personally subscribe to it. And also, you are always free not to read it. Mm -hmm. I read this ad because I felt that I had to for this book. I didn't enjoy any of it, and I kind of wish I had never looked at it in some ways, personally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But politically, it feels essential to me. So I think what's more interesting in that sort of to censor or not censor question is uplifting writers and artists whose work is contrary to those 
toxic dominant ideologies and focusing attention on them rather than thinking about banning people to think about the voices that are divergent to that that give us visions of sexual freedoms and sexual liberties that excite us that liberate us and that make us feel larger in our own lives yeah instead of focusing on the cancelling. I read somewhere in an interview that most of the characters in your book, like, or the <laughs> thinkers, would probably be all be cancelled uh, um, right now, because you have this, I think, fascination for people, you know, who have uh, different sides and who change in the course of their lifetime, you know, um, in their thinking. And I think my, my sense with this book, as I, as I worked on these characters, and all of them have aspects of them that, that are unpleasant, that are violent, that, that are um, off, off beam in one way or another. And what really struck me is that I think the people who are bravest at resisting the forces that, that bear down on them are also often the ones who are most damaged by it. And I think that you can certainly see that with right that somebody who is so capable of speaking up and talking back to forces of fascism or forces of patriarchy also become very um, vulnerable to those forces. They're, they're attacked in lots of ways. And I think it's sort of unsurprising that they end up being damaged. And mapping that process was very important to me. I don't want to sanitize them. I don't just want to show them in their most saint-like aspects. I want to show them in the round and show the whole picture. Yeah. Well, let's go then to um, the feminism in your book, and it's really con concentrated on uh, sexual freedom, uh, sexual pleasure, and sexual violence. And there are these two uh, characters, or uh, thinkers you come up with, it's Andrea Dworkin and Angela Carter. And um, I think for already decades in the feminist movement, there's always this discussion of uh, victimhood versus agency. Yeah. Um, it's a really difficult discussion, but I thought maybe you can explain it to us, us based on the ideas of Dworkin versus Carter. Yeah, absolutely. So Andrew Dworkin is really one of the flagship figures of, of second wave feminism. And in some ways, her story actually starts in Amsterdam. She, yeah. she married an anarchist activist and when she was very young, really in her early 20s, and the relationship became violent, incredibly violent, and she tried to escape from him, and he kept capturing her, he kept beating her, and that um, relationship really, I think, d destroyed something in her. She escaped, she got back to America, and she started to write a book called Woman Hating, and this book is really trying to sort of pull back the veil on misogyny and violence, what, what she was trying to do was explain that what had happened to her was not just an individual experience, it was a mass experience. It was an invisible epidemic of violence against women. And she wanted to expose what we now call rape culture. I don't think it was called that then, but at the time she was writing, marital rape wasn't even a crime in most states in America. So she was really trying to expose something that was absolutely habituated and considered normal and try and say, this is unjust, this is appalling and this must end. So her whole take was to show women as the victims of violence. And there were many women involved in second wave feminism who weren't comfortable with that. Angela Carter is one of them who wanted to say, well, actually, women are wily, women are resourceful, women have many different ways of responding. And for me personally, these women would say, I, I don't find it helpful to be portrayed as a victim. I don't find that useful and that isn't the feminism I subscribe to. And this battle, which really operated particularly around sexual freedom and questions of sexuality and especially pornography, is really what tore second wave feminism apart. So it remains this kind of open wound in feminism. And, and how do you think this dichotomy relates to freedom? What I think it's all about freedom. I think that one side is saying there will be no freedom unless these systems of violence can be stopped. There will be no freedom for women unless we can end these systems. Yeah. And I think the other side is saying I don't want to weep for my freedom for men to change their behaviour en masse. I want to seize my freedoms now. I want to feel myself as sexually free now. Those, those two sort of thought views don't match up. They're very um, resistant to each other. And I think that 
split in feminism really it lives on till today it, yeah. it, it continues yeah you write like um, in a struggle for a world without sexual violence is that the struggle or the right to engage in any kind of consensual act yeah, and that is uh, yeah what yeah. you point out here it's also that uh, what I found very interesting is that almost the way uh, Andrea Dworkin writes about sex made you almost feel guilty of your own sexual desires. So it was, yeah, yeah it, it, it turned itself around uh, almost. And uh, Yeah, I think so. That was my experience. I mean, I encountered her towards the end of her life and that was my experience of her. But coming back to her now in yeah. this, you know, post Me Too moment, her writing feels extraordinary. Again, she's somebody who I feel like I missed huge amounts of the, the import of her work, the yeah. intense power of her work. Yeah. And and why was, if we go back to William Reich, like why, what did he do for the feminist movement? Why was he so important for the feminist movement? Well, this is the thing about Reich that I think has been really overlooked. So he grew up inside a violent marriage. He, his mother had an affair and his father found out and he beat her and beat her until she killed herself. And I think this is what underpins all of Reich's work as a sexual liberationist. It isn't just the sort of orgasms for all vision that's been sort of perpetuated in the 21st century of Reich. Yeah, because you go, you go very fast, but maybe people don't know because the, he's called kind of like the had the orgasm man. Why, why was that? Yeah. Absolutely. So he, he was involved in sexual liberation work in the 1920s and 30s. He brought those ideas to America. And that's really the vision of Reich that sort of has had stayed when I was writing this book. The idea was that Reich was all about the orgasm will cure you, the orgasm, apocalyptic orgasm. And a lot of men in the bohemian circles of the 1960s, the counterculture, found that very gratifying. <laughs> However, the Reich that I'm more interested in is this young man coming out of this very violent and abusive parental relationship family and what he saw what he wanted was a world where women could have sex women could have sexual freedoms without being subject to violence without being killed it's a very radical vision even now he wanted a space in which women could have abortions he wanted a space in which women could practice the kind of sexual experiences that they wanted and not be judged, not be shamed. So he is asking for an end to this sort of sexual apartheid. And a hundred years on, what he dreamt of has still not been achieved. And that's the radical side of right and sex that I find really, really interesting. Yeah. Oh. Well, I didn't know him. So I was really happy that you uh, brought him into my... Uh world of ideas. Um, you also write about the relationship between the body and imprisonment. Mm. And um, I think this starts with Malcolm X, uh, but a lot of people you write about end up in prison. And um, yeah, why is the, the people in your book, they yearn for freedom and why, why do they often end up in prison cells? <laughs> I mean, that's a good question. Why do activists end up in prison? Why do people involved in freedom movements end up in prison? And I think it's because activism is powerful, but it's trying to change systems that are in control and those systems are very resistant to change. Yeah. It's, it was very interesting to be finishing this book just as a law is passing in Britain that is going to criminalize protest much more tightly than it has been in the past. And I think that is really a product of Black Lives Matter and the climate change movement, that those have been very, very powerful. And there's a sense of wanting to make it harder for people to carry out those sorts of protests. And the way in which a state, a government, stops, limits people's freedoms at the end of the day is prison. That's, that's the tool of the state. And it's a very frightening tool, I think, for many people. So I really wanted to talk about the activists that had had the courage to and be imprisoned, to, to continue until they were imprisoned and to not stop. So Malcolm X, but especially Bayard Rustin, a civil rights activist. Yeah, tell more about him because I think he's a little bit forgotten in a lot of history textbooks. Absolutely, I didn't know him at all. I only came across him because he'd been in the same prison as Reich. And he was the most impressive figure. He, as a young man, he was, an anti-war activist then got involved. He's a black gay man in the 1930s, 1940s, 
anti-war activist and then um, starts to try and desegregate the prison that he's being put into. So he is put into prison because he's a conscientious objector and he immediately works on desegregation and he gets into more and more trouble. Eventually he's released. Immediately he goes out on the precursor to the Freedom Ride. So traveling out into segregated states and groups of black and white people and trying to resist segregation on public transport back into prison. And on it goes back into prison. He's involved in the March from Washington. The problem for Rustin was that he was an out gay man at a period that was immensely homophobic. So even among civil rights people, he was in some ways ostracized for his sexuality and among gay people, he was ostracized for his race. So he, he calls it time on two crosses, doing time on two crosses. And this history of imprisonment in some ways makes him a hero for the civil rights movement, but he was also imprisoned for his sexuality. He yeah. was also imprisoned for sexual encounters and that made him a pariah. So you see him as this figure who really exposes the ways in which our bodies can be politicized permanently. His sexuality makes him politicized. His race makes him politicized. Yeah. And all he's asking for all the time is larger freedoms, the freedom to have the desires that he wants, the freedom to kiss who he wants, the freedom to travel on a bus where he wants. Yeah, yeah because that's what you, because when you talk about uh, prisons, I thought, yeah, okay, your body is locked up in a prison, so your freedom has been taken away. But what you also wanted to show is like, you don't have to be in a prison, but your body can feel yeah. like a prison. Uh, and I think you you beautifully show this with this man, but also in the uh, beginning of the 20th century with a lot of um, um, homosexual people then living in, in, in Berlin. Um, yeah. You also write how when you are in prison, you can still be free. And this is the Malcolm X story, really. This yeah. is the unbelievably inspiring Malcolm X story. So he, again, real and victim of, of racism, he became a hustler and small time criminal and ended up in prison. And in prison, he has this kind of radical awakening which really is to do with learning to read. He learns to read, he improves his reading, he has a dictionary, and gradually he reads his way through this extraordinary library. I mean, these days, Britons don't tend to have libraries that are as good as the one that Malcolm X's prison had, but he read and read and read. He read the history of slavery. He began to understand how the world worked. And he says, though I was in a prison cell, though I was sort of reading under the blankets with the torch. At the same time, I felt myself freer than I had ever been because language makes him free. Language gives him a sense of how the world works. And that creates a sense of mental freedom that cannot be dismissed, I think. Yeah. I, um, there's another case that I thought we didn't have the time for, but we have because you talk, <laughs> you go very fast. So, um, and that is, um, what sickness does to our body, also when we think about freedom. And there you uh, come up with Susan Sontag and Casey Ecker, and that uh, these are two women who have uh, severe forms of cancers, but very different way in which they approach their sickness. Um, yeah, could you also touch but upon them? Because I thought it was also very interesting, and then we can give this tableau of all these interesting thoughts <laughs> that you share with us. Yeah, of course. So I wanted... I wanted really to understand more about Reich's idea of what happens inside our bodies being meaningful. So his, his sense of character armor over time became a more sort of scientifically dubious sense that we develop illnesses because of our emotional background. We develop illnesses because of trauma and that idea remains controversial. I think there are people who are, are beginning to really argue about it. If you think of books like The Body Keeps the Score, for example, yeah. that's really making an argument that emotional trauma can lead to all kinds of bodily disorders by way of its effects on the immune system, by way of its effects on the heart and so on. So this is Rack's idea. Susan Sontag, in the 1970s, developed cancer. And 
as soon as she did, she began to wrestle with this idea of rights. She began to wrestle with the idea that illness is meaningful in real rage, in real fury. So she wrote illness as metaphor, really as a, as a riposte to him, as a response to him, to say, how dare you say that cancer is the result of emotional rep repression? Cancer is just a random movement of cells. It means nothing emotionally. So this is the book that Sontag published in Mrs. Metaphor. But at the same time, in Sontag's diaries, in Sontag's letters, a whole different account emerges, which is that she does believe the right conversion. She is immediately and instinctively, as soon as she was diagnosed with breast cancer, began to think about her own emotional history, her relationship with her mother, the ways in which she felt she hadn't been bold enough in her life, her sexuality. Illness became a ground for her to think about all these things. So I was completely fascinated by that sort of schism in some yeah. type. And then Kathy Acker, who comes from a very similar background, Jewish, wealthy, New York family, also developed breast cancer and responded to it in absolutely the opposite way to Sontag. She embraced all of those new age ideas about what her illness meant. She didn't want to have any kind of medical or scientific treatment. She wanted to just have emotional therapy to understand what caused the cancer she believed would cure the cancer. Yeah. Now, they're extreme examples, and I don't think either of them is wholly right or wholly wrong, but I wanted to sort of map out that dynamic because I think illness is a way of thinking about what our bodies are. Are our bodies the repository of our past? Are our bodies the repository of our emotions? Are our bodies political? Are our illnesses caused by political factors, political forces? And I think all of those things have an element of truth about them. So that, that was why I put together those two characters yeah. to try and trace that very complicated landscape. Yes. Uh, I have two more questions, uh, but first I would uh, like to give the audience a chance. Are there any questions? Please, please raise your hands. Also, if you maybe want to have clarified something, it's also... Um, no? Yeah, there's one uh, You have to wait for the mic, otherwise uh, people can't hear you. Um, so I also never heard about uh, Reich. So why do you think he is so... Uh, yeah, he almost fell into oblivion if it's 100 years ago, or he's so unpopular, unknown? Why do you think he's so popular? Or impopular. Oh, impopular, yeah. Yeah, yeah good question. Um, well, so we haven't really talked about the second half of Reich's life. The first half of Reich's life is in Europe, and as you can hear, I'm enthusiastic about many elements of it. The, the second half of Reich's life is in America. He left as Hitler came to power and as Freud went to England, Reich went to America. And for various reasons to do with what was happening in Europe, to do with his relationship with Freud, to do with his own increasingly fragile mental health, he changed his theories. He became, like I've sort of intimated, much more pseudoscientific. He invented a um, device called the organ accumulator, which was designed almost to sort of obviate the need either for therapy or for activism. It was like a box you sat inside and became more enlivened, freed yourself of your character armor. So this is where I sort of part company from him. And what happened is that Reich, Reich's device drew the attention of the American Food and Drug Administration and they pursued him over a decade. They carried out a court case against him, banning him from talking about his work, his ideas, and publishing any books that, that mentioned these concepts. And this culminated, because he refused to stop publishing, this culminated in the only book burning on American soil of all of his work. The Nazis had burned his books in Germany, and then the Americans burnt his books in New York. And this includes books like The Mass Psychology of Fascism. This includes books that had nothing to do with the pseudoscientific material. He was sent to prison and he died in a prison cell. So he really was a pariah figure. And I think how he lived on in people's um, imaginations, really, he was picked up by the counterculture in the 1960s. And as we were saying earlier, he was remembered as sort of the orgasm man, somebody who talked about orgasms. 
and for the organ accumulator. But these much more radical, much more relevant, kind of cutting edge thinking that he came up with in the 1920s and 30s really got buried. So that was the stuff that I wanted to go back and sort of exhume because it felt so relevant to our own increasingly troubled times. Is there another question? Yeah. Hi. Um, I heard somebody say the other day that uh, during the corona pandemic, being locked up in the house actually um, showed or showed a lot of mental creativity and freedom. And it made me wonder, is there a difference between mental freedom and bodily freedom? Um, or is it... Yeah, how do you see that relationship? Are they the same? Are they different? That is a very good question, because I think it really varied the lockdown, that some people found it almost liberating to be allowed to drop out of the world for a while, to be able to spend time alone, to not be caught in that treadmill of commuting and going to the office. And then I think for other people, especially people living in impoverished circumstances, people living in violent relationships, it was a nightmare of captivity. So, you know, it varies wide, widely, but I think um, the idea that even though imprisoned in our bodies, we can have a kind of freedom that our mind can run free of our body. I think that's true. I think that's one of the sort of extraordinary things about humans, but at the same time, I think it is no substitute for having bodily freedom too. And I think the sense that people are oppressed because of the kind of bodies they inhabit, that some people have different experiences of life than others because of arbitrary bodily factors like gender, like race, like sexuality, that is the kind of bodily freedom that I'm interested in demanding. And of course, anyone can access different kinds of mental freedom, but if on the streets are experiences of heckling or of rape or of violent attack by the police, and that isn't happening to other people, then those are the kind of bodily freedoms that have to be secured. Thank you. I have uh, my last two questions because we've talked about all these interesting thinkers, but then there's also you, the interesting thinker, and you are also personal in your book, so that's why I dare to ask this question. Um, yeah, I thought, because you chose the body, and I thought, yeah, what does it mean to you to have a body, and has your idea about this changed while writing the book? I think I've always been really interested in the body. I think, you know, as a person in my 20s, I was very involved in environmental activism. And then um, I trained as a herbalist. I worked with people who were ill for a long time through my 20s. I come from a gay family, so I experienced that sort of homophobia and prejudice. I'm a trans person, again, experience prejudice. So that, that sense of the body is this sort of political entity that we are locked inside and that has all of these experiences that we carry around with us that that was what fascinated me and i think when we talk about bodies in popular culture we talk about their appearance we talk about what they look like we talk about our weight or our fitness and i'm not interested in that i'm interested in the experience of living inside this mortal vessel this this object that will die and trying to make sense of how we can make that experience full of liberty and full of joy, but not just in a selfish way, in a way that is communal and in a way that is shared. Yeah. And has it changed during uh, writing? Like, has... I mean, the world changed so drastically, almost exactly as the book came out. So it's been a very strange experience. I imagined that when I wrote this book, I would spend my time traveling and physically speaking to people. Yeah. I thought that there would be a chance to be in rooms talking with other bodies and to have spent the last year having these disembodied conversations makes me even more certain that our, our bodily lives matter so much that I don't want to live in the metaverse of Facebook. I don't want that future of virtual reality. I want a world where our real bodies are together. That, that feels like a deep longing for me. And I think at the end of lockdown, it's a deep longing for many. Yeah, definitely. Um, then let's end with freedom. Um, 
in your book, Nina Simone is one of the last persons you bring up, and she has this revelation almost about what freedom means to her. And I hope you could uh, tell us about this revelation and if it relates to your idea about freedom. Yeah, so Nina Simone is, um, I think, for me, she was the most exciting character in the book. She's, she's, like you say, the last one. And she was somebody who experienced racism throughout her life and then became involved in the civil rights movement. And she, her gift to the civil rights movement, her, her role within the civil rights movement was to play, was to perform, was to have these concerts that allowed people to move through many feelings, to experience their grief and their rage, and then move into joy or hopefulness. And, you know, in some ways she's carrying out very Reikian work. I think that in some ways she's like a Reikian therapist. Mm -hmm. And she was asked by a filmmaker in the 1970s what freedom means to her. It's a, it's a clip that's available on YouTube and it's worth mm -hmm. watching because it's sort of astounding. She's bowled over by the question. She's like, I don't know what to say. I don't know what freedom means. And then she sings and she says, no fear. That's what freedom feels like to me. It feels like sometimes I touch on it in a concert. It feels like I have no fear in my body. I am absolutely free. And I found that vision so beautiful. And yeah, I think, I think in some ways that that is my sense. And when I wrote it, I wanted to say, I don't mean being without fear, I mean being without things to fear, to have that sense of knowing that you're in the world safe in the kind of body that you live in. That's a vision of freedom for me that I think, I hope can come. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Olivia Ling, for sharing uh, your thoughts with us, sharing this beautiful book with us. And uh, I really hope that your body can travel soon <laughs> and uh, we can meet you here uh, in the Netherlands. Olivia Ling. Thank you very much. <laughs>